Баба Фабра за Малостовия да изтрува, да завърши цялото творение, както вятърът ръчи в облаците. Коментарът е на Баба Фабра. Сравнението на творението с облаците е много подходящо. Облаците се образуват в небето, се съсуват в небето, и когато вятърът ги разпуска, се става прах небето и вече в непроявено състояние. По същия начин, в определеното време, върховното божество на личност, в облаци на грама, се дава творението. Няма в образа на вишна да се вържа и как тя го унищожава, приема в образа на рък да изтрува. Сътворението, поддържането и унищожението на Вселената се отне много добре във вага в Бита, осма глава от главнаци в Бита, не последва. Бутва Рама, Паева Ям, Бутва Бутва Пърлия Ти, Бутва, Шрадхляда Ми, Паша, Паша, Павара, Паша, Ада Ми. Парата смат Бутва Бутва Стоя Сарта Нахна, Ахаса Сарвити, Бутичи, Нашачи, Нави, Нашити. Материалният свят е така устроен, че най-напред по съвършен начин се сътворява, след това се развива и дълго време остава незменен. Толкова дълго, че най-великият математик не е свечен и да се върви за възможността на Бравието. Това се върви за възможността на мъжка на Брама и отново се унищожава. А когато наближи краят на мъжка, той отново се създава и в него отново започва да действа същите закони на поддържането и унищожението. Ако на глуповите обикновени души, приели време на набирене в тази сладост, няма жилище, и не остана в поне капка разум, тази се опитват да разберат дете на сътворение и унищожение. Вършителите на повиносни дейности на материалния свят се благословени строят огромни предприятия, огромни здания, огромни империи, гигантски промишлени и много други огромни и преогромни неща. Енергията и промените стига да съмнява върховния Бог или материалната си представител. Тези ресурси, цената на енергията си, обикновените души творят и за да изтърят веществите си. Но след това пласни волята си са принудени да се разделят от творението си и да приемат друго жизнено състояние, за да започнат всичко от начало. Изведнъж на някаква надежда на глуповите обикновени души, които протеряват енергията си в тленния материален свят, Богът им дава знание за това, че съществува друга природа, която е вечна, несътворима и неуничижима, и че те могат да разбират какво трябва да правят и как да използват тената си енергия. Но ако за сега изведнъж на енергията си в материален свят, която по върховната воля е обречена и уничтожена за съдбен отрок, обословените души трябва да насочат към предно служене на Бога, за да могат да се единят от друга вечна си природа, където няма разлина от своят сътворен и уничтожение, и където животът е вечен, изпълнен със знание и безкрайни блаженства. И така временното творение се проявява и уничтожава, за да могат обикновените души да са привлечени от временните неща, да получат знание. Този свят е сътворен, за да взе възможност на обикновените души да познаят себе си, а не за да удовлетворят мотивата си, към тази страна всички вършители на предносни дейности. Тадакалагни рудратма, ячъщам идам атманаха, сани ячъти тоткали, гана никам ивани лаха. Thereafter, at the end of, of the millennium, the Lord Himself in the form of Rudra, the destroyer, will annihilate the complete creation as the wind displaces the clouds. <laughs> Yeah, like Srila Prabhupada, he uh, quotes these two verses from the Bhagavad Gita, they are very appropriate. It is mentioned also in the, uh, in the 18th verse, one before this Buddha Grama it is explained there that at the beginning of Brahma's day all living entities become manifest from the unmanifest state. And when the night the night of Lord Brahma falls they are merged into the unmanifest again. And then uh, 
Yeah, this this verse 19. Uh, again and again, when Brahma's day arrives. When all living entities they come into being. <coughs> and with the uh, arrival of Lord Brahma's night. They are helplessly annihilated. So it is further mentioned in the uh, Srimad Bhagavatam third canto that there are three uh, kinds of annihilation, destruction. The first one is due to the scheduled time of the annihilation of the entire universe. That's at the end of uh, Lord Brahma's, the two halves of Lord Brahma's life at the end. And the second one is due to the fire which emanates from the mouth of Lord Ananta. And the third one is due to one's qualitative actions and reactions. A karma that also has a destructive function. Then it is further explained in the Srimad Bhagavatam at the time of the final devastation of the complete universe. Uh, the flame of fire emanates from the mouth of Ananta. From the bottom of the universe. And then the yogi, he can see how all the planetary systems burn to ashes. And thus he leaves for Satyaloka. Uh, with the help of an airplane which is used by purified souls. And then he takes shelter in the Satyaloka system. So now, uh, in verse 18 in the Bhagavad Gita, in this, uh, these sequences of verses, it is mentioned av, uh, avyaktat and vyaktaya. This uh, avyakta, avyakta, this refers to the uh, uh, when uh, Lord Brahma's night arrives. And there's also another verse, Vyakta Vyaktat Sanatana. And that uh, was it mentioned here. Yeah. Parastas Matu Bhavo Anyo Vyakto Vyaktat Sanatana. So this Avyakta, this refers when uh, the planetary systems are destroyed. Hmm. Then all the living entities of that particular Brahmanda or universe, all the way up to the planets of Brahmaloka, along with the big oceans, etc., all repose in the belly of the Virat Purusha. And then uh, Lord Brahma, he sleeps. He takes rest. Then in the uh, 12th cant of Srimad Bhagavatam, there are four categories of annihilation are men described. Uh, 
And the first one refers to uh, the continuous annihilation or nitya. Uh, of that we have practical experience. Constantly something is destroyed. Especially this is our experience in, in our temples. <laughs> All the time somebody destroys something. And also, of course, so many other things. Uh, whatever we see manifested right now, any material object, we can be assured at one point it will be destroyed. That's the actual nature of this world. Due to the time element, everything is being destroyed in due course of time. This time factor is such a uh, powerful energy of the Lord. It is his own energy. When uh, Mahavishnu glances over material nature, then all the uh, living entities with their respective karmas and uh, the time element enters into the womb of material nature. You, it's cold, you can close a little bit. Um, and this time energy activates the three modes of material nature. And it's just like if you imagine a machine, let's say, for instance, a printing machine. It's a huge, uh, huge apparatus, huge machine. So many parts and parcels. But it is just sitting there motionless. But then the printer, he will come in the morning and he pushes one button. And then the whole machine starts uh, set into motion. So the whole day the printing machine is running, producing so many, so much uh, garbage. <laughs> so that's what uh, the Supreme Lord does. He glances on the printing machine of this material manifestation. By his glance he pushes the button. That's the time element. And then everything set into motion. And then at the uh, end of Lord Brahma's life, then the Lord he pushes another button. And then everything is annihilated, everything stops. And then when Lord Brahma goes, uh, when he wakes up again in the morning, then the Lord, he pushes another button. <laughs> then Brahma can, Brahma can work again. Recreating everything at a, as it has been uh, working before. You see, Lord Brahma, he, at the process, during the process of creation, he's chanting various Vedic mantras. And these Vedic mantras, they are, or integrated into these Vedic mantras, are the principles of material uh, creation and manifestation. Just like to give you an example, uh, a car is a principal name for uh, uh, automobiles. 
That's the overall name. The cars or a car. But then there are so many individual cars. They have different names, different shapes, different colors, etc., different speed. Or the same thing with uh, human beings. That's a principal name, category. A categorical name. But there are so many individual human beings. The, they have different names, different uh, forms, different shapes. Also different speeds, uh, different intelligence. So similarly, there are categories of demigods, categories of uh, planetary systems, <coughs> and categories of uh, so many things. Now when Lord Brahma creates in the morning the uh, universe, beneath Satyaloka. Then by, by chanting these uh, uh, Vedic mantras, he remembers the different uh, species of life, different planetary systems, different planets, and then he creates. He is being reminded of the previous uh, manifestation. So that occasional creation by Lord Brahma and occasional uh, annihilation, it is called Naimitika. Naimitika. So first there's Nitya, continuous annihilation, all the different objects are being dest destroyed continuously. Due to the time element. And uh, the next one is Naimitika, occasional annihilation. <coughs> And uh, at that time, Lord Anantas, uh, he, he, uh, from his mouth, uh, fire emanates and burns all the planets to ashes. And then, as mentioned before, the uh, yogis, sages, they feel this burning heat and they all escape in uh, wonderful airplanes to the highest planetary system. <coughs> then the third category of annihilation is uh, pra Prakritika. That refers to uh, mm, when the elements, <coughs> the various elements are being destroyed systematically. Especially yogi, he can uh, perceive this. Also, how the various elements of his own body are being destroyed, dissolved, as he attains liberation. And then the fourth category. That's the final annihilation, Adyantika. That's at the end of Lord Brahma's life. Then the entire universe, even Brahma, Loka, everything is annihilated. That happens when uh, uh, Mahavishnu when he inhales. Just imagine the uh, how 
how uh, mighty, how, how great, uh, how powerful Mahavishnu is. <laughs> when he inhales, all the universes are being destroyed, annihilated. You see, this is a clear concept of uh, the greatness of God. Mm. Others, of course, they also recognize that God is great. Alu Akpa, he is very, very great. But how great? Oh, that's another question. But simply to know he is great, this is good, this is wonderful. But uh, it is more wonderful to know how great he is. <laughs> Therefore, Krishna, he uh, reveals in the 10th chapter of Bhagavad Gita his greatness to Arjuna simply in order to increase Arjuna's uh, devotion to him. <coughs> Therefore, it is so important to hear about the Lord's pastime in connection to this material world. Sometimes, unfortunately, neophyte devotees, <coughs> they uh, do not appreciate very much these pastimes of the Lord related to this world. Especially the uh, Sahajiyas, those who do not follow the rules and regulations of uh, devotional service. They imagine that uh, they attained already liberation. They imagine that they are Mother Yashoda or Nanda Maharaj like this. They always want to see Krishna behind the bush in Vrindavan. So they only uh, are, <coughs> are trying to uh, absorb them themselves in the, especially the Rasa Lila of the Lord. Thinking that they have become gopis. Sometimes you even see in Vrindavan, have you seen in Vrindavan? You see sometimes men that are dressed as gopis. <laughs> you know, they're a little bit unshaved and uh, wearing sari. <laughs> <laughs> when I saw this for the first time, I thought, my God, what is this? <laughs> these are these Sahajiyas. <laughs> They think they attained Swarup city. Hmm. I remember one funny story. <laughs> In the early days, there was one devotee. He he became a little bit contaminated by the Sahajya uh, philosophy. So there are these Siddha Deha, you say, Siddha Deha gurus, huh? Siddha they tell you your original spiritual form in the spiritual world. They give information about your eternal spiritual form. So they are sitting in one place and then people come. Oh, please reveal my eternal spiritual form to me. You have to pay some rupees. And they gladly accept. <laughs> and then they tell you that you're a peacock. <laughs> then you have to walk away. Next one. <laughs> <laughs> you're a tree. <laughs> Next one. <laughs> like this. <laughs> so one devotee, he also approached such a Sita Deha Guru. And he informed the devotee uh, that uh, your eternal Swarup is that of a peacock. And then that devotee, he tried to walk just like a peacock. 
And then Srila Prabhupada heard about this, he became very, very angry. <laughs> he said, this is not the process how to attain liberation. <coughs> so similarly, sometimes you see these uh, uh, sahajiyas dressed as gopis. <coughs> and uh, they do not like, for instance, <coughs> Krishna's pastime uh, in relation to the uh, war of Kurukshetra. They don't like to hear about this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is, they think this is, this is only for new fights. Mm-hmm. Because there are some material elements in these pastimes. <coughs> Spiritual life means to enjoy in the forest at the middle of night. But this war business, this is all mundane material. And also the fifth canto, they do not appreciate at all. <laughs> and especially not the third canto. <laughs> Where Lord Kapiladev explains, uh, you know, analyzes material nature. They do not feel attracted to this. They only want to enjoy the sweet rice of the tenth canto, Srimad Bhagavatam. But they do not like shak, some bitter, bitter uh, preparations. They do not like. But this is not very good. It's just like imagine, you know, that we are eating every day, morning, in the morning, we eat sweet rice, halava, gulab jamins, and something else, and uh, rasa gulas. I also forgot. <laughs> yeah. And lunch exactly the same. <laughs> and in the evening maybe half of the preparations. <laughs> the next morning again, sweet rice, gulab jamins, rasa gula. That was the fourth one. The lunch exactly the same. So every day. Week after week, month after month. Now you think this will be very healthy for your body? Who thinks like this? Raise your hand. Ah. <laughs> so therefore we have to also eat some bitter preparations. Just like a bitter, bitter me- melon. No. Bitter lemon? What is that bitter word? Lemon. Bitter lemon? Yeah. Bitter lemon. What is it? Kerala? Hmm. Huh? Kerala, huh? Yeah. It's still small, you fry it in a pan, it tastes very bitter. Small round, you cut in pieces, and they are big, uh, you know, flat, thin pits inside and you cut into slices and then you fry in the pan or in ghee, a little salt and it's tasting bitter. And uh, also shak, the green vegetable, spinach, uh, they all belong to the category of uh, bitter preparations. <coughs> oh, one thing is also nice, the uh, neem leaves, fresh neem leaves, you deep fry in ghee. <coughs> then add a few spices, add few spices. Oh, very tasty. <laughs> but it's bitter. So in the beginning, we uh, those who enjoy sweets all the time, they, they hate this taste. 
But uh, <coughs> the uh, the good thing is when when you eat these bitter preparations, it purifies the blood. And in this way you stay healthy. But if you never eat bitter things, only sweet, 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 then you you grow sick and you also grow in size. <laughs> and then you, you get problems with your blood, too much sugar in your blood. Mm. And it might end uh, or it might develop into a deathly disease. So therefore the previous Vaishnava Chardis, they recommend <coughs> that neophyte devotees, <coughs> they should especially hear about the Lord's pastimes in relation to this world. Because that will gradually, gradually purify our attachment to this world. <coughs> Just like, what is the whole idea to hear about the process of creation, annihilation? Now, who can imagine? What is the idea behind it? Why does Shukadeva Goswami describe the process of annihilation in, in such a detail? Uh, and also of creation. Can anybody imagine? <laughs> Especially in the case of Maharaj Pariksit. Nobody can imagine? Yeah? Yes. So that Maharaj Pariksit, be, because he also had to face the fact that he has to leave his body soon. So by describing the, the uh, temporary nature of this world, it uh, Maharaj Pariksit systematically <coughs> he uh, he uh, he is being prepared by Shukadeva Goswami to leave uh, this world, to leave his body. So this should be the conclusion. But in a materialistic society, you exactly all the time hear the opposite. You know, I love you, you love me, and we stay together forever. <laughs> Life is eternal and <laughs> so many illus illusory concepts. <laughs> we will enjoy forever all these slogans. So, and then uh, naturally you become illusioned more and more. Thinking that everything will last forever. But uh, <coughs> the Srimad Bhagavatam does not put the uh, uh, living entity into such an illusion. It confronts the living entity with the reality. And that's the reality. That everything in this world is temporary. Mm. Including our body, of course. And even some you know, some Vedic sense enjoyers, they they might calculate, all right, life is temporary, but I take birth again, what's the problem? <laughs> So you cannot impress them very much that uh, by explaining that uh, your, your life is temporary. 
What's the problem? What's the problem? I take birth again. Then I continue to enjoy life. Therefore, it is described here that there are so many different categories of annihilation. Okay, you might uh, calculate or plan to enjoy life after life. But then you have to face one day the situation when you are in the process of enjoyment and all of a sudden you feel some heat. <laughs> and it's becoming hotter and hotter. And then you are being burned to ashes. But somebody is very, very attached, he even, he even accepts that. But then Lord Brahma, he awakens, and then I take birth again. <laughs> so such foolish attached living entities, it, it is very difficult to uh, explain anything. Because they are so attached to this sense enjoyment that they refuse to accept transcendental knowledge. <coughs> So it's like you can never wake up a person who's pretending to sleep. <laughs> so somebody who's too much attached to this world, you can give all sorts of good instructions, but he will not listen. He will not take anything serious. But Maharaj Parikshit, he belonged to a different category. He wanted to receive transcendental knowledge. And he wanted to hear how flickery this material existence is. <coughs> we cannot find any permanent situation in this world. Constantly we are being pushed uh, from uh, one position into another position. From one body to another body. One planet to another planet. One universe to another universe. Constantly kicked by the laws of nature. Just like I gave the example the other day of football. There's no peace for football. <laughs> He's being kicked and then he flies high into the sky. And then he's descending to the ground. So then he might think, oh, finally I have a little peace. But very, very uh, fast, rapidly, there's, there's another football player with huge, strong legs. He's approaching the ball. <laughs> And he gives another kick. And again the ball is flying. So that's our position in this world. <coughs> now we were kicked out of our uh, previous body. And we were flying through the uh, space of this universe. And then now we landed in this body. <laughs> but we can be sure that uh, already a very strong lacked <laughs> law of nature is approaching us very fast. <laughs> and then exactly at that point when we think, oh, now I feel like, uh, you know, that I, I found some resting place, some, some uh, uh, lasting position. And 
then we will receive that uh, merciless kick, boom. And again our soul is flying out through the mouth or ears or <laughs> into outer space. Taking shelter in some other uh, field of activities. <coughs> and again kicked, again kicked, again kicked. So at one point the soul, if the soul has a little intelligence, he begins to feel tired of this constantly being kicked and traveling and no lasting position. <coughs> it is just the example is given, just like a businessman. He's traveling, he's doing so much business. He has to fly to Hong Kong. The next day he is in Los Angeles. Then he has to fly to New York. So constantly flying, flying, flying. So of course there's so much amusement, you know, on his way in between. In the hotel room he can watch some TV. But the next morning he has to fly off again. So how, how long can he do this? At one point he returns home. Oh, and then he feels, actually then he feels some peace. <laughs> Without any anxiety he can lie down on his own bed and relax. So when the conditioned soul uh, begins to feel the pangs, you know, the, the strain of material existence, then he might uh, inquire into his eternal home. And when he receives transcendental knowledge about uh, his eternal home, the transcendental world, and when he receives knowledge about the uh, uh, transitory or, or, or temporary nature of this world, his desire to return home back to God had grows stronger and stronger. And so very enthusiastically he takes up the process of traveling home, returning home. And he is not any longer disturbed by the temporary allurements of the uh, illusory energy. He is not uh, distracted any longer. He is fully fixed on the goal of going home back to Godhead. So therefore Krishna, he uh, states in Bhagavad Gita, Ekeha Kuru Nandana, these devotees, those who practice devotional service in order to return home back to Godhead, their intelligence, Ekeha, it is one-pointed. They only have one goal in life, not two. Therefore Krishna at the end of Bhagavad Gita, he demands from Arjuna, Mam, uh, mam ekam, that you have to surrender to me, nobody else, nothing else, <coughs> not a second interest, only one interest and this is me. That's Ekeha Kuru Nandana. We surrender to Krishna and then go home back to Godhead.
This is the whole goal of this movement for Krishna consciousness. <coughs> Not to establish ourselves in this world very nicely. By this system or that system. We want to return home back to God. Yeah. We say this in our entire material existence goodbye. <laughs> was nice to be here, but <laughs> thank you very much. It's time to go. <laughs> That's the mentality of a devotee. <laughs> he does not want to become entangled again. In the name of Vedic this, Vedic that. There's also Vedic sense gratification. <laughs> the devotee he wants to give up entirely the process of gratifying his own self separately from Krishna. He is fully fixed on one goal. To become detached from this world and then return home back to God. Yeah. That's the meaning of Ikeha Kurunandana, one pointed intelligence. This intelligence is always working in that one direction. So, as in the Mahabharata, the example is given. Arjuna, uh, Drona Chajya, he uh, requested the different members of the Pandavas and even Kauravas. They fixed one replica of a bird on a, uh, in a tree, a small device machine, a bird, artificial bird. <coughs> so then he uh, told the uh, Yudhishthira Maharaj and the Bhima Sena and some others, what do you see? So they, the, well, there's a bird in that tree. Do you see anything else? Yeah, so many the clouds, sky, so many things. Do not charge he said, all right, that's it, move aside. So they <laughs> they're disappointed the next one. <laughs> <coughs> Again, same question. <coughs> 